Welcome to GTC 2014. This is what started it all. CUDA and the invention of GPU computing launched this event. As I was showing up this morning, a good friend said, this is the Woodstocks for computational mathematicians. I hope, it's, I hope it turns out the same way. I hope it turns out the same way. Well, CUDA was invented because we were inspired by three things. We felt that graphics was going to be ever more computational, that the type of imagery we would like to create required the flexibility of a completely programmable computational medium. The second thing is we felt that long term, generating the image is impossible unless you do the physical simulations of the world before you create the image. Physics simulations coupled with computer graphics was essential to the future of interactive graphics. And the third, because we felt that visual computing was much larger than computer graphics alone, that the application of visual computing is going to surprise us all if we're able to make it computational. This event demonstrates exactly that. Now, the sustainability of this combination of CPU plus GPU, this perfect combination, stems from the fact that the two processors are so different. The CPU is designed for low latency, single-threaded performance. The GPU is designed for high throughput, massively parallel performance. These two processors were made possible to work harmoniously together by the invention of CUDA. And the capabilities are seen here at GTC. The results of that capability was made possible and brought together by your work. And that's what GTC is all about. GTC is growing and expanding. The span of work that is presented here and highlighted here is nothing short of astounding. 2010, the number one focus was really high performance computing. The supercomputing crowd first adopted it because the problems they were trying to solve were simply too large to do otherwise. 2012, two years ago, the types of applications started to change. In addition to supercomputing, we saw energy exploration, life sciences, molecular dynamics simulations, genomics. And now this year, the largest GTC we've ever had, nearly 600 talks in the several tracks that you're going to experience in the next week. And the topics range from big data and analytics, machine learning, and computer vision. Each year, the reach, the span of GTC grows. We now encompass quantum levels, atomic levels, molecular levels, geologic to astronomic. Research done at every single scale of the universe that we know. One of my favorite parts of GTC is called the ECS. I really encourage you to go enjoy it. ECC stands for an Emerging Companies Summit. This is where companies who rely on the GPU to create their ideas, to innovate and bring something new to the world, to make a contribution, start their company. And you can see over the years, it's growing. And one particular area that we focused on Big data, cloud, and computer vision, you can see that over the last several years, it's really grown quite nicely. The use of GPU technology, the use of CUDA, for these three particular fields are going to be my highlights for today's speech. So let's, let's get started. While GTC is also about announcements and great demos, let me start with Roadmap. Every single year, through architectural innovation, we bring more computational capability to the GPU. 
But as we compute more, we have to move more data around. That's one of the big challenges of big data, the data bottleneck. And in fact, I'm highlighting here a work done by Aoki-san in TITEC, and he was one of the earlier pioneers of using CUDA. And this is a paper that he wrote, and it elegantly highlights some of the challenges of using GPUs. He talks about the bandwidth bottlenecks. And in the first slide, the different thickness of the orange shows where the bandwidth is high and where the bandwidth is low. You can see that between GPU and the memory, the GPU memory, the bandwidth is incredibly high. That's one of the great resources of the GPU. But there are bottlenecks all over the system that we have to think about. The second chart, Aoki-san highlights that in fact the performance asymptotically levels off as the amount of data per unit of computation grows. He describes it as flop per byte. And then the third chart, he also highlights, because of inter-GPU communications, the performance asymptotically flattens out versus linearly scaling because the traffic and the amount of data you have to communicate between GPUs grows. Well, this paper highlights some challenges that exist even today. While many of you have, in fact, invented all kinds of technologies that overcome these bottlenecks, whether it's smart DMA, so that you could pipeline the computation with the data movement, all kinds of ideas that you have so that the GPU could be computing while you're moving data in the background, overlapping the data and the computation. But in the final analysis, if we have to increase, if we want to increase the performance, we're going to have to solve some of these bottlenecks. We're going to have to take these bottlenecks head on. I've simplified the chart into something that's, in fact, quite easy to understand. If you look at the bottlenecks in the system, PCI Express at 16 gigabytes per second, the CPU memory at 60 gigabytes per second, and the GPU memory at 288 gigabytes per second, shows you the mismatch between those three resources. So the first of the technologies we would like to announce today that is part of our next generation GPU is a very important invention. Today we're introducing MVLink. MVLink is a chip-to-chip -chip communications. Differential signaling with embedded clock. The, pro the programming model is basically PCI Express with enhanced DMA capability. And so software can adopt this interface very, very easily. It enables unified memory between the GPU and the CPU, and the second generation cache coherency between the GPU and the CPU cache. Altogether, because we're able to pile on eight blocks, eight signals in one block, scale up to four in the first generation, up to eight in the second generation, we're able to take PCI Express and increase its performance, increase its bandwidth, increase its throughput by five to 12x. A big leap in PCI Express performance, a big leap in solving this bottleneck. Well, we could use this chip-to-chip -chip interconnect between GPU and CPU, but we can also use this chip-to-chip -chip interconnect between GPU and GPU. As you saw in Aoki-san's paper, GPU-to-GPU -GPU communications becomes quite an overhead and avoids and prevents us from scaling linearly. Now, one of the things that we would love to do, and it's some, one, of the, one of the benefits of parallel computing, is to be able to take all these GPUs and put them in parallel and treat them like one big massive GPU. If we only had the bandwidth to communicate from GPU to GPU, NVLink allows us to do just that. If you had NVLink in your system, you could also use it for GPU to GPU communications. NVLink, the first enabling technology of our next generation GPU. The second technology has to deal with memory bandwidth. We have 288 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth already, 
It is already many times that of the CPU, which is one of the great reasons why the GPU contributes so much to parallel computation. But we would surely love to have more. We would love to have many, many times more. But the challenge, of course, is that the GPU already has a lot of pins. It's already the biggest chip in the world. The interface is already extremely wide. And so how do we solve that problem? We can go wider, which makes the package enormous. We can make the signaling go faster, which translates into too much energy consumption. As a result of that, the energy efficiency of your system declines. And we know we're power limited in almost every application that we are pursuing.